Yes, this is Rocket Ship from Rock Bottom. And Rocket Ship from, from Rock Bottom is a term that I first heard when Jasmine spoke at the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum in uh, Nanaimo, BC this past fall, 2020. And I thought, what an amazing way to represent some of the powerful transformation that can happen when somebody seems to be at their worst. And my history working in the psychedelic realm comes from working with over 200 people using a powerful plant medicine called the Ibogaine, mostly for opioid use disorder. So I've seen so many transformations that can happen when people really are at their worst. And I thought, uh, let's do something with that. So I'm not even sure where the conversation happened, Jasmine. Maybe you can remember better than I can, but we said, let's do a webinar. Let's do a webinar featuring more transformations. And then when I, when I met Steve and James, when we were kind of doing a prelim talk for this presentation, I said, you know what, there's a, there's a web series here. Let's, let's, let's not make this the only one. Let's do a whole bunch of these because these are some of the sweetest stories around plant medicine and transformation in general is when you just, you, you meet real people. Like these dudes are real Canadian dudes from, you know, the middle of Canada. Not, uh, I live on the West Coast. There's a lot of this hippie stuff happening on the West Coast, but these guys are living in Kenora, Ontario and Winnipeg respectively. So this doesn't just happen to us hippies on the West Coast. This happens all across Canada. So with this new show, Rocket Ship from Rock Bottom, we're going to really do what we can to feature everyday Canadians from all across Canada and share some of the amazing stories that can happen when you do hit that rock bottom. And I'll have uh, Jasmine share a little bit more in a second about where that uh, saying came from or where how that has impacted her. Um, I first wanted to do a few housekeeping kind of announcements. For one, we are the Canadian Psychedelic Association. We've been going for more than a year now, and I've got to say, we've put some awesome stuff together. I'm incredibly proud of the team that has come together around this. Thank you to all of our volunteers. There's far too many to list now, but this is entirely volunteer driven. There's so many incredible volunteers involved here. And we're also open up for membership now. So if you would like to become a member of the Canadian Psychedelic Association, by doing that, you help to support things like these webinars. Um, our membership program is about to become a lot more robust. We've got something called My Networks, which we're tied into, which is going to be an online community that people can plug into. And it's really awesome. There is a, a cool Canadian event that's happening May 7th to 9th. The Canadian Psychedelic Association is proud to be a title sponsor of the Catalyst uh, Catalyst Conference. It used to be called the Catalyst Calgary Conference, but then COVID happened and now it's online so we can all enjoy that conference. Jasmine's going to be speaking at it. I'm going to be speaking at it. Uh, Michael Pollan, Paul Stamets, Rick Doblin, Janice Phelps, Erica Dick. There is going to be some incredible speakers at the Catalyst Calgary Conference. And if you go to psychedelicassociation.net, you can get 10 percent off the tickets for that online conference. And I think that's enough for announcements for now. I'm going to introduce uh, the main host for the evening. As I said, when we were doing a bit of a tech check before, I am going to play Ed McMahon to Jasmine's Johnny Carson today because Jasmine knows these guys and this is, uh, this is real life to her and it's, it's really deep in her heart that this comes from. So uh, Jasmine Perazic, I met for the first time at the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum in the fall and we kind of hit it off right away. We were being billeted at the same house. So we got to hang out in the evening and uh, really get to know each other. And uh, my partner Brianna was there as well. We, we were staying with a fabulous uh, psychiatrist and his wife. And I, I knew as soon as I started talking to her that, uh, she needed to become a part of the Canadian Psychedelic Association. So she quickly agreed to becoming a part of our advisory board. And then within about five minutes, we realized we need to put her on the actual board of directors. So she's an amazing 
uh, member of the board of directors. She brings such grounding and such insight. I'll, I'll let her introduce herself and her work to you a little bit more. But um, it's, it's pretty incredible to be on these board of directors meetings when Jasmine breaks out in song and sings an ayahuasca Icaro and brings us all into our hearts. And just, it, it's a real honor and privilege to be working with her and an honor and a privilege to be doing this web series with her. So Jasmine, I will pass this off to you. Thank you so much, sister. Oh, Trevor. Yeah, brother. Thank you so much. It's such a very sweet, um, sweet introduction. And I had, I couldn't refuse the, the the offer that you had to to come to the CPA because I know that we can we can reach more people. I I just got into uh, doing things online and getting followers and stuff, and I'm not the greatest at that. So uh, the education that I've I've acquired so far has been really really valuable um, for me. Um, so mayingananque and adishnikas ngizi nidu them. I am. They call me the Wolf Star Woman, and I'm from the Eagle Clan. I am from, well, Kinesau Sipi. Uh, Norway House Cree Nation is my community, but I was born and raised in Kenora, Ontario, on beautiful Lake of the Woods. And this is where I currently reside at this point. And I'm going to build my healing center, Boom Bay Integrative Healing, uh, here in Kenora, so that hopefully we could have access to uh, psychedelic medicines and um, assistance or even just um, verbal assistance from other people that have lived through the experience of recovering themselves through psychedelic medicine or through just discipline and practice. And discipline's a really strong word, but but these men who I've in, um, invited here today understand what discipline really means. And the reason why I called it <clears throat> the reason why I use the term rocket ship from rock bottom is because I felt like I was down there. And, and that's why I started um, going to ceremonies, ayahuasca ceremonies. We call it Camarampi. I started going to these ceremonies um, because I had no help. There was no help from Western medicine for me. Uh, the doctors believe that I have, I had MS or I developed it into my thirties, but they couldn't diagnose me. And it just crushed me because there's no there's no options other than immunosuppressants, which would, you know, suppress that healer inside myself. So I I found a, a maestro, Juan Flores Salazar in the Peruvian Amazon. He is for Mayantuyaku. Um, I guess they're an integrative healing center, healing and learning center as well. And my life changed. So I, I was at my lowest and my partner and my, my husband now, he really supported me through those really, really tough times. And I felt like when I was at my rock bottom, because everybody's is going to be different, uh, the opportunity to, to, you know, travel the ethers as a psychonaut, uh, how could you pass that up when you are just at the bottom? So I, I wasn't anticipating that I would recover my body, but I, I sure did through discipline and practice. And um, I think through singing my Icaros as well, they, they really played a big part of how I have helped myself to recover. Um, but it's every, every day, it's little by little that we got to do something. And so I feel like this, this meeting uh, with everyone here is, we've all been to these places where we've been at rock bottom. But like I said, there's a rocket ship down there. So you could get in the rocket ship and you could you can get help very quickly or you can take the steps or you can try to, you know, navigate the cavern as much as you can, little by little. Uh, but I felt like the, the psychedelic method really, it, it was the rocket ship for me personally. And so when I met Steve and... When I met James, they had very similar, I guess, similar story. They, they're they not similar at all. They both have very strong stories in and of themselves. But we all came to a place where, where, yeah, we were at bottom or whatever your bottom is. And we had to change things. And we changed things very rapidly through 
um, discipline in education and, and the listening to our hearts. I think that's the main thing that has fed most of us. Um, so that that's the reason why rocket ship from rock bottom. And that's why I use the term in, in my talk at the psychedelic psychotherapy is because I didn't know how else to explain how quickly um, we can grow and change with a little bit of assistance. And it doesn't have to be all the time. You, it could have been one experience that you had and it just changed your whole life. So with that, um, I, I wanted to speak to Steve and to James because their stories are just, they're so close to my heart. And many times when we, I, I really wanna educate many academic people uh, who are kind of from the ivory tower because I've been in the ivory tower uh, where, where you don't get to be on the ground and see what, what the effects of these medicines are. So I feel like we're going to educate um, through our stories and through everyone else sharing their stories, educate those in academia. And it's going to, it's going to help propel this psychedelic renaissance that we're in right now. So I would love to hear, um, are we good to go there, Trevor? If I, if I said we were, okay. Um, I would love to hear uh, James's story. If you could tell us, you know, just give us the gist of what kind of rocket ship you got on or how that, that worked for you. Okay, so my rocket ship was, um, well, my rock bottom, I'll talk about my rock bottom a bit first. So yeah. My rock bottom was in and out of jail. My, all of my teens, I was addicted to hardcore drugs, um, intravenous drug user for like 15 years. A lost, written off as a lost cause to judges, cops. Everyone just thought I was a lost cause. There was no hope. And the last time I was in jail, I spent like four or five months total in segregation. Um, then I got out of jail and things changed for me. I started, well, actually they didn't change right away. So I got out of jail and relapsed on fentanyl and then I, I learned about meditation. It, it was weird how it all happened, but I learned about meditation because it wasn't just ayahuasca in my rocket ship. There was numerous things in my rocket ship, but ayahuasca was a major thing. But uh, I started meditations and learning about chakras. And that's where everything started changing for me. Um, the chakra system, through, through meditations, I quit eating meat, I quit eating sugar. Um, I stopped, I stopped doing so many things. It was weird how it all happened, but it was all preparation for when I went to do ayahuasca. Because when you go to drink ayahuasca, you're supposed to prepare your body. You're supposed to like purify yourself because then you react to the medicine better. So everything I did up until there was preparing myself for changing my life. When I drank ayahuasca it was the most, it's hard to even put it into words to anyone because it's just phenomenal. The change, it cracked my head open and made me face myself and release everything that was holding me back. There was so much there and it's just unexplainable, honestly. It's really hard to put into words, but, um, <laughs> So it was like going to heaven. When I went to Peru, it was like going to heaven and being healed by angels. Like the people there, they just knew what to do. And I spent my life in Kenora trying to navigate the broken system. Like I've been to detox, recovery homes, treatment centers, in and out of jail, all these things. And nothing worked for me. And I like now that I'm healed, I sit around and watch the people that I used with stuck in the same broken system I just escaped from. And it's really hard to escape when we don't have the resources. And the government stands in the way but by like making these things illegal or prohibiting them and stuff like that. We need to bring them, bring the medicines here and merge them so everyone can heal. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, when, when I met Alan, um, it, was, it was during your harder years. I think it was maybe five, five or six years ago. I, I can't even recall how many years it's been, but your mother asked me to come see you. 
because she was aware that I, that I, I do what I do and I, I go and I pray for others. And so I came to your house and I, I prayed for you and I, I wished that you could, you know, you're in a state that I could give you ayahuasca and you definitely weren't. But um, I remember going in and singing for you and praying for you, hoping that you would find some way of connecting with, with a way to recover because you're such a great person that I, I just wanted to see see your recovery and and just to see you today and, and how hard you worked. Um, like what have you what have you um done for you know what have you what have you done that's so monumental? And and I could list a few things, but I, I'd like to hear it from you um say in the last few years here. So last since I got out of jail, I've um I beat I was on amphetamines for ADHD. I quit that. I quit methadone. Um I I quit weed for a bit, but I'm smoking weed again because I think weed is an important tool in in all recovery. It's a dopamine, serotonin producing drug. And when you quit all those things, your mind craves that so cannabis is a really important tool for me in recovery and it should be a tool used from everyone in recovery Could I interrupt there a bit because as somebody that's spent a lot of time trying to get people off opiates I was very impressed by the fact that you quit methadone on your own could you speak to that a little bit oh yes I quit methadone five times total actually uh, three of the times I did it cold turkey, one time off 120 milligrams. And um, the last time I did it, it's uh, it's about having your mind strong. And meditation helped me so much with straightening and balancing my mind and preparing me for the battle of putting method on. And uh, I fasted for my first two days, which I don't even know where this information came from, but I fasted for my first two days. I just thought of it. Because you flush your system. When you fast, you flush your system, you urinate. You know what I mean? So I cleansed my system that way and I ate weed oil and I took Valium for the three days, only at nighttime. And I beat methadone in like four or five days. And that that was the, the easiest time I've ever done it. It's usually like a month long withdrawal and severe, like bedridden. But yeah, methadone was one of the worst opiates to quit. Wow, because a lot of people don't um, may not realize that that's an opiate that's legally used by the medical system that many people get stuck on. Like many of the northern communities, they they don't have access to methadone. They use Suboxone. Did you ever use Suboxone to try to get off opiates? Oh yes, I was on. I tried Suboxone, but because I was addicted to fentanyl, it it didn't work for me. I was addicted to fentanyl and I was on Suboxone and the fentanyl is too strong. So it put me into severe withdrawal. I had to shift back to methadone. It was brutal. And that's another thing. Methadone is a tool. To it, You can use it as a tool, but it shouldn't be on. You shouldn't be on it any longer than two years. People that are on it for like, you got to heal yourself from the time. You got to use it as a tool to heal yourself, to get you in a balanced frame of mind. So you can allow that healing to come in. Because it's just another drug at the end of the day. Like I quit carfentanil. I've I've withdrawn off carfentanil, and methadone is worse than that. So you know what I mean? It's 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 one of the worst narcotics, but it's also a very good tool if you use it properly. So you were saying um, that you know a lot of people talk about cannabis as a you know, a gateway drug to using drugs. That's what the term they used in the um, Nixon's war on drugs. But I, I remember you saying when we were talking that cannabis is like an exit strategy rather than, you know, leads to drugs, it leads you out of drugs. Can you touch on that a yeah. little bit? It was, it was a gateway for me out. I was like, cannabis has helped me so much, like medicinal marijuana. Cause like I was an extreme addict, like I did meth and I did it like really, it messes with your hormonal balances. You know what I mean? It messes with your dopamine and your serotonin. And it's hard to balance that when you just stay completely, like when you quit, that's why weed is so important. 
it's a major tool. PTSD, which most addicts that most people that are addicted, well, I'm, I would almost say all people that are addicted have some form of PTSD. That's another reason why cannabis is so important. It helps you manage your depression, anxiety, your PTSD, all of that. I tried quitting for three months and I did it, but I was depressed for pretty much most of the time. So you think legalization in our country since 2018, maybe that can help to, has helped many people to recover? Yes, for sure. Because now in recovery homes, like, uh, for example, in Kenora, if you have a prescription, you can be in the recovery home with marijuana. Where it was a no-no before, you tested positive, you'd go to jail. So at least now you can get a prescription and still smoke weed. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So this is one change in the recovery homes that has actually been beneficial um, through legalization? That's Yes, exactly. But they need to be more, they need to do more. Like they could do more and they shouldn't have to. Most, this is a flaw though. Most people in recovery homes can't afford for your prescription. They can't afford to get the prescription or they don't have the doctor to get the prescription. So they should be allowed to just smoke weed, but they don't do that. The systems are so flawed and they hold us back in so many ways. It's really hard to navigate the system. Like I have a friend right now that's in a recovery home in Winnipeg. He was going to go to Teen Challenge, but they denied him there. He just has no place. But I know ayahuasca is the way or ibogaine. One of those two would help him tremendously change his life. And he's tried everything. He's been mental, mental, like mental health, all that stuff. And nothing works for him. But I know Mother Ayahuasca would change his life. I got that feeling too. <laughs> Yeah. So even um, after you've you've gone through your recovery, didn't you build your home? Did you yes, build a yes, home? Yes, I did. I built a. Yeah, I, I got an off grid home, and yeah, I live in my own home. I never even would have imagined that two years ago. It took me a year, and I live by myself on forty acres. It's pretty good. Complete change. Like I was in. I spent like at least six to seven years in jail, living in group homes, um, just the worst. It was the worst life, but I don't know, to come back from that, like when I look back and reflect on the changes I've made and where I came back from, it just blows my mind. Like I was in hell and I jumped in that rocket ship and blasted myself out I didn't crawl the steps or take my time I just did it and that's another thing is when you can't just expect ayahuasca isn't just it is a magic tool but it's only magic if you if you put in work you have to put in that work man you have to like you said discipline like prepare yourself for the medicine because if you just go there thinking ayahuasca is going to do all the work you're not in the right frame of mind you got to put in that word. I think the it, it's interesting to me to hear Jasmine you talk about how when you first met James where he was so down and out you basically couldn't do anything except sing and pray for him and then I find it really interesting that you know you might say that that song and that prayer really worked because then it seems to me James like it's it's this spirituality that started creeping in first with this, with meditation. And it's so often like Bill W., the founder of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, he, in the end, wanted LSD included in those 12 steps because it really helps facilitate that spiritual awakening, which seems to be so crucial in the recovery process. Is that how you view this overall for yourself as kind of like a spiritual awakening? Absolutely. Like that's what it was. I woke up. I woke up from the deep sleep that I was hypnotized by and changed my life. It, it was absolutely because I've, I've, I have uh, psychics. I work with psychics. I work with Reiki energy workers. I've done so many things, uh, shamanic soul retrieval, where, because when you go through traumas, there's fragmented parts of your soul that you lose along the way and they stay stuck. And there's practitioners that 
can help you recover those parts of yourself that you lost along the way. I did that. I did inner child healing. Um, I did. I microdosed with mushrooms. I microdosed with LSD. Uh, yeah, I did MDMA before, but not in a medicinal purpose. But the ayahuasca, the LSD, and the mushrooms are what helped me, and cannabis, of course. Yeah, I find that those plants that have um, that spiritual component. Um, I, I I wouldn't I would argue with the MDMA and ketamine that I'm not totally certain there's a spirit there. Maybe it makes me realize I'm the spirit, uh, but it, I'm still out on it because I I, I don't have enough education uh, to talk about such compounds in that in that larger way. And plus, because it's so easily abused on the street that it's a uh, it's something you don't necessarily want to mess with, especially if you were a, you know, methamphetamine addict or somebody that had a, had a problem there. It might always use your discretion. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that with everyone, even with the cannabis, like make sure to use your your good discretion. And but these are conversations that we have to have. You know that cannabis being a doorway out instead of it being the the doorway in, as uh, uh, Nixon put it like 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm really I'm really proud that that I'm I'm really honored that you would share your story James because sometimes when we feel like we are at rock bottom it's like we can't get out. Like we're just circling in that pit in that hell. And I've circled around that hell myself. Um not necessarily in the same way but because we all have our, our different methods of, our different ways of rock bottom, uh, definitely. That's, it's wonderful. Thank, thank you, James, for sharing that. That's, thank you, Jasmine. And then you're just going to, you're going to inspire so many. And that's why I wanted to share your story. Um, I'm just going to look at the chat here. Thank you so much for sharing your story, James. Very touching and inspiring. I agree. It's about going within and facing and healing trauma. So happy for you. Yeah, I'm, me too. I'm so, I'm so happy. You're just such a, an excellent example of someone that can come out of it with strength and, and then help others to come out of it as well. Um, on that note, I would love to hear from, uh, I'd love to hear Steve's story because Steve's story is, not necessarily like James is, but Steve has gone to the limits as well, uh, just like James has. And going to the limits and going to the limits of our discipline and our education and our hearts uh, is a big, big sign of recovery and a, a sign of healing. And we all live in our own type of hell, you know, when we're we're down and out. Um, no, I'm going to I'm going to just make a note like I'm not making any recommendations. You guys are just sharing your stories and we're not making recommendations. We're just saying there is a way out. Um, and I, I make sure to make that footnote with Steve's story because Steve's story is, is extremely powerful as well. So, Steve, I'd love you to just take it away. Well, where do you want me to start? <laughs> I want you to start from before you Christian bailed. That's how I put it. Before you, you, you did like Christian Bale in that movie. <laughs> well, I've always been a very curious fellow. I've always been a very, um, you, some would say I'm very hard headed. My work ethic is, you know, it goes beyond its limits, as some people would say. And even as a kid, I started questioning earlier and all that kind of stuff. I grew up in a house where my dad was a police officer, you know, I love pop to death. You know, you kind of grew up with that system inside of your house and, you know, freedom of expression isn't really there at all the times. Uh, you know, I was one of those kids. I went to Sunday school and stuff like that. I was actually kicked out of three Sunday schools just because it wasn't jiving with me. I was getting forced into it. I didn't want to be there. It's not it's not how I learned. Very, I'm very visual, very hands on, very let's go do it type of learner. And even in school, like uh, junior high, high school and all that stuff, it, that, that just wasn't there for me. And so I was about 15 years old. I started getting into exercise and exercise science and stuff like that. I picked up 
you know, my first magazine, my, uh, Muscular Development, I was reading these things, you know, you have all your scientific names that are this long, and my dictionary beside me trying to figure it all out. And from there, it progressed, worked a lot of physical jobs, moving furniture, I give a shout out to all my furniture movers out there, hell yeah. Um, <laughs> did that for a number of years after high school you know i worked two to three jobs just because i like to work <laughs> uh, then it came to a point where i was having a cup of coffee with my buddy and he's like why don't you go to school for you know exercise i was like okay yeah i'm in so literally just got up went to the university signed up and boom i was in i was like 22 i was like holy crap i'm going back to school and so just jumped right into it so i studied for five years i got a degree in kinesiology majoring in athletic therapy Eight months before I graduated, I was offered a job in professional sports working in uh, professional football. And so, again, right into the thick of things, hardcore giving her. You're working, you know, when season starts, you're working seven, you're working a little seven, eight months straight, seven days a week, up to 10 to 16 hours a day. And you're just, you're going and you're going. You're working with, you're constantly around an environment that's like rah, rah, hardcore going, injuries happening, stuff all around you. And so, I'm always a guy that's always reading. I'm always studying. I'm always experimenting. It's just who I am. It's kind of who I always been. And it got to a point where I was working again in pro sports and I was still had to work three jobs just to provide for my family. My wife was in school and so I was a sole breadwinner. And so I would be up at, you know, four or five in the morning. Some nights I wouldn't, you know, five, five days a week, I wouldn't get home till 10 o'clock at night. And I was just, I was running on, that wasn't even running on fumes. Fumes were gone. And it got to a point where I'd be sitting on the sideline and I'd be watching the clock tick every second, every second. It's like, Steve, you can make it through this. Okay, change. Okay, watch it again. And then it was, I would say, my mindset started to change. And I was watching it. I was listening to it. And it started to change. It was going to a not very good place. And so I was like, oh, this is, this, it's like, how do you stop it? And I, Never really cared for the medical system. Uh, I was always looking for the alternative stuff. It's just something that was always inside me telling me that kind of thing. I have tried, you know, supplements under the sun, never went to steroids, uh, all sorts of supplements. But then I was always like, well, these supplements come from somewhere. There's a whole, like that holistic way. Where is that? And there's more to it here. And we'll get to that in a second. And so get to the point watching on the sideline mindset starting to drop and i'm in i'm working at my other job at uh at this other gym and i'm sitting downstairs this guy walks by he's like, you ever heard of ayahuasca and i was like interest peaks right like i have not and you know i was in high school i smoked a lot of weed pretty much medicated myself through high school just to get through it uh you know ate mushrooms a few times never really went anything there so it'd been you know, a decade since anything like that kind of popped into my mind. I was eating clean. I was uh, feeling really good. And I was, I was like, okay. And so I didn't really look into it because like, I don't want to, I don't want to set any expectations before anything happens. And so I mentioned it to my buddy. My buddy's like, ah, that's weird, man. Because literally I was just talking with a buddy about it last week. He's like, let's go do it. All right. So here's my wife, you know, like, I don't agree with this, but I'll support you. All right. Awesome. Love you. <laughs> Did a tobacco ceremony the day before. Cleanse it all out. Get it out. Uh, then did the, uh, went the next day uh, for an ayahuasca ceremony. And so, you know, sitting there, drink that medicine. I'm just kind of watching, not really knowing what, what's going on. Feeling this good vibe in there. So I lie down drinking the medicine i'm just watching i remember watching my buddy's doing whatever he's doing over there and i'm watching ceremony ends you know three or four hours like everyone's singing it's good vibe you know people some people are crying it's like this is, this is great and people are recovering this is awesome because again i went into a field of therapy you know not necessarily that specific therapy but you're still dealing with people have an injury and they're going through something there's more there than just dealing with you know a hurt knee or something like that Right. People are opening up to you. They're giving you the poor in their hearts out to you. You got to deal with that. So just a different context. And so at the end of it, I was like, man, there's some there's something here. There is something here. So I went back. <laughs> Curiosity peak. I went back. And prior to that, I had started meditating myself. I was like, OK, I'm going to do this. I can only handle three minutes. That's all I could do. 
you know, mind's going crazy, this and that. And so I kind of set a goal for myself. So, okay, you're practicing this meditation. You know, I was reading I Ching, Tao Te Ching, going uh, that type of philosophy. I was reading all sorts of philosophies and stuff like that. Um, and I was like, okay, let's go after it. And so practicing meditation, better cleaning, preparing myself for ceremonies and all that kind of thing. And I was also a big fan of fasting. So specifically intermittent fasting, because so now intermittent fasting is big. It's the newest rage, yada, yada, yada. I help you lose weight, do all these things. Be careful. Um, and so <laughs> the I was experimenting with fasting while working out a lot, like working out a lot, you know, two or three times a day. It, it was a lot, but fasting as well and putting all these things together you know, preparing for ceremony. And so I remember reading, I started to read about stuff from the 1800s and the early 1900s called the hygienic system. And they would use fasting to help cure things. So I was like, oh, this is interesting because when I was a kid, I couldn't eat dairy. They had told my mom I was lactose intolerant. And, you know, you're using words, you can damn people. So you gotta be careful what you say to people, especially in a certain state, that stuff sticks. And so I had this in my mindset, I couldn't eat this stuff and that was eat certain foods. And so that was with me. And so I had a really hard time with my digestion, my stomach, you know, if I would try and I wanted to eat this thing that smelled absolutely delicious and was wonderful. But then my mind's like, no, things tighten up. And so I did a, I was reading all this fasting and 40 day fast, 20 day fast, you know, go as long as you can type of fast, intermittent fasting. And it was in December of 2016 where i had finished reading uh dr herbert shelton's full series of books and i did an ayahuasca ceremony on december 28th and i woke up you know three days later on uh, new year's day i woke up and i just heard go for it fast and so this is where i started my fasting journey and i'll tell you how long and what we did Prior to that in December, I had a buddy come back from my Antiaku and he hands me this card. He's like, you should call this girl and you should talk to her because you're interested in plants. And again, because you have been doing supplements and all these types of things, learning about that. And I wanted to deepen my knowledge, you know, get a, another perspective on it. I wanted to learn plants. And so he passed me this card, get this card. I'm like, okay, let's call this chick up, get on the phone. Hey, Jasmine, my name's Steve. I'm calling you out of the blue. I got your card. I want to learn about plants. What do you want to do? And so this is where I met Jasmine. And I started my fast on January 1st. I went for 42 days. I do not recommend it. I do not recommend it. I'm a guy, again, I've had to learn. There's a lot of learning in my side of things too, because I've gone to, I go to extremes. And now I have, I have, a, I have a little guy, two-year-old guy, Wesley. I got another one on the way. I got a family. I had to learn to bring that back, right? You know, some things... You just got to say, not right now, maybe later. You just kind of push them off to the side a little bit and just say, no, thank you. You know, the power to say no. It was another thing I really struggled with too, was the power to say no. And in some ceremonies, I learned how to say no and to stand up for myself because there was a lot of things there that I had trouble with. And it reflected in my work ethic. It reflected in, you know, why I always felt like I was in hell. It's like, why can I never get out of this? You know, the power to say no. And so I went to, I think it was to Jasmine's house, second week of February in that year, 2017. And she's just like, you just see you know, her, her and her husband's face, like, what the hell's going on? This guy's like offering me coffee. He's like, no, 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 thank you. I'm fasting. What are you fasting for? You know, just, we're going to see what happens. And so I'll tell you a bit about the fast. First three days were okay. Uh, four, to, four to 10 days was brutal. Um, bad. No food cravings, just pain, discomfort, grossness. And so I was like, we're going to go in there. We're going to go. We're going to open that up and we're going to go in there and we're going to sit with that. And we're talking about sleeping maybe three to four hours a day. We're talking about still being social. Uh, I was uh, enrolled in a massage college at the time. I was going to massage school. I was still learning. A lot of things going on. Um, and, you know, three or four hours of sleep and I journaled. You know, some you could almost call a little bit of a recapitulation, going through those energies and those emotions, stored emotions, and writing down those thoughts that came up, really focusing on it, and you know, being very mindful of it. 
and writing it down, journaling, all that kind of stuff. My wife would wake up in the morning to go to work. I'm sitting at the kitchen table. I'm just crying my eyes out as I'm writing. Da, da, da. Just working through things, letting it come out. Because, you know, when you when you're in that fasting state, it's the way I look at it. When you're in that fasting state, your body's not digesting. Your body has time to rest. You can, it's, you don't have those distractions. You can really go and do that work that you got to do. And so for 42 days, I did that. And it was probably the, the last three or four days getting in there, where, you know, everything kind of started to settle down. I went from 193 pounds to 150 pounds. So I lost pretty much a pound a day. Um, I would, if you look up Christian Bale and the machinist, that picture, that's what I look like. That's what everyone said I look like. And uh, so I understand what that guy went through. I get it. <laughs> totally get it. <laughs> Steve, you were scary. You were, you were frightening. I, I didn't think people could do that. I, I didn't think, like, did you just let us know about the water? Tell me about you drink Everything. water because legally not legally in western medicine that's not even possible absolutely so i drank maybe like a, a half a cup of water every three or four days because i just couldn't i couldn't take it my body couldn't handle ingesting something and i just i just went with it i trusted in it and i just went with it and so i did all this cleaning and then i remember that 42nd day i grabbed that orange and i looked at it and i was like cut it open and you ready like can i do this because the one thing was you go that long without food it's not being scared of the food it was kind of like being scared of whether i was going to be able to eat again because it's like you go that long you just kind of stop thinking about it and that's scary that's scary that's scary thought and able to bring that back in in a good way and totally looking at food taking it like a complete different appreciation for that food source I remember cutting that orange open i remember smelling it I remember licking it and i actually understood what an orange tasted like like wow and i devoured the thing ate it too fast broke the <laughs> broke my fast a little too quickly but i ate that thing and it felt good and uh from that i think it was a couple weeks later after that fast maybe two or three weeks later i participated in another ayahuasca ceremony and I was able to sit there. And one thing I was really proud of with that was able to sit there for, you know, I think it was a long, about five hours in meditation without moving, just stillness, without anything affecting me, nothing. So I really had created that power inside myself to say, no, sit in my, sit in my center and kind of be who I am without any of that interference coming in. So really powerful things from, you know, fasting and uh, ayahuasca. And so with that, it was that year. So it was April. I left pro sports. I literally, I jumped. I had no, no job lined up, no nothing. I jumped. I got on that rocket ship and I said, I'm out. Because there's, there's something more here. And in my heart, you know, I've asked those hard questions. Who am I? Why am I here? You know, where am I going? I've asked those hard questions for myself. And I, I found the answers. And one of the things that rings, uh, resonates with me deeply is helping people always been a person to help people and it was something that i wanted to create my own thing for and so i started cutting ties with all the other things that i was doing to really focus on helping people and working with people that want to help people you know who share that same you know mindset but never mind the mindset the same that share the same heart's desire and and go that way so i jumped i spent time up um I, met a, I made a friend up in Kinnesota, Manitoba. He's got a farm up there. Spent time on the farm, learning how to farm, learning about animal husbandry, learning about feeding plants, all that type of stuff, butchering. I spent a lot of time out in Kenora with Jazz, working, uh, learning about plants and picking, you know, uh, the sacred off offerings. I spent a lot of time around the sweat lodge, uh, learning about, you know, creating your foundation, your base of what it means to be like a human, to be. Uh, to be human, right? Uh, to have those teachings and what it means to have a community and all those sorts of things. Because I, if you look at my background, I didn't have that. My grandparents came over, well, my grandpa came over in the 50s, in 1950, my, grand, my grandma came over in 52 on the boat and, you know, ripped from their home type of thing. And then when my baba died, 
my grandparents, my parents, and my family, they buried that with them. And I was like, uh -uh. <laughs> we're going there and we're digging that up because that's not right. And when I started on this path and I was telling my parents about it, you know, my dad looked at me and dad, my dad is a man of very few words. And he looked at me and he said to me, he's like, your Baba would be proud of you. And being a Slavic, coming from that Slavic nation, you know, I knew I was doing the right thing. And so I was like, let's just keep going. I'm going to keep asking these questions. And I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go. I'm going to keep riding this rocket ship. Sometimes the rocket ship slows down a bit, <laughs> you know, it likes to, likes to take a look at the scenery as it goes by. It's a great, right? It's life. It's a journey. Poco e poco, way e you know, keep going. Um, and so I spent a lot of time around Sweat Lodge, uh, time around Sundance, learning all these beautiful things, beautiful culture, back, you know, people who live with Mother Earth, you know, that's part of them. It's, it is part of us, it's who we are, you know? And when we start cutting that from our life, you know, that's where things start to kind of go awry, you know? So you think the disconnection is what, like the disconnection and trauma, like for both Steve and James, that's what's causing these issues, right? This lack of connection. And what it sounds like to me is that you folks found deep connection inside of yourselves. Very much so. 100%. Absolutely. You know, it was, at first, you're you know, a little bit afraid to acknowledge that just because parts of society look at it like you're a quack or look at it like you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? But it's there. You know, it's damn well there. So stop, <laughs> you know, stop crying out loud. So what it sounds like to me is that you guys, you guys found your hearts. Both of you found your hearts. And, and this is what's lacking in a lot of the, the treatment um, care systems or in the Western system that's trying to help, but they're kind of missing the mark. Mm -hmm. That's what it seems like, right? Yes, absolutely. So coming from, again, working with people, working with bodies, you know, you're, you're set up, okay, you know, again, depending on your practice type of thing, but, you know, an hour, your time slot. Well, you know what? Sometimes you need to work on a person for three hours. Sometimes you need to be with that person for four hours. You know what? They can't afford it. Well, guess what? I'm still going to sit with them because it's what they need. You know, where's the compassion? Yeah, I know both of you. Um... I guess are peer counselors for for others that could be going through something similar or like how about James like how is, how is that when you're working with others like do you connect well with people and are your methods like your your teachings for them helpful have you seen that that evidence well, yeah. I've guided a lot of people to uh all kinds of different healers and I've got to see like them get the smile put on their face again like people that wouldn't smile smile again now just from this one healer from hawaii susan man she changed my life she's like a huge major role in my life i've guided like over 60 people to speak to her and all of them have had well most of them have had profound changes and pretty amazing to see and be uh, helping other people is is good because it's hard to be stuck man in that circle that you know the circle of trauma you just keep going through the lessons and not learning them and you're just stuck and it's nice to help people get out of that or at least show them the way because at the end of the day it's the person that has to get out it's no one else it's that person that has to make the decision to leave the circle of hell so it sounds I mean, like it's totally possible like it's absolutely possible when, when yeah. even academics would be like, that's not physiologically, neurophysiologically possible. How is that even, that's not safe or that's not the right way. But what it sounds like to me is that you, you both found a way of reconnecting and integrating and then helping others to, to be affected that way. Absolutely. I think another thing is that which I have a feeling will be a very common theme in this uh, web series is you both had very different rock bottoms. You know, your stories are incredibly different, but once the transformation kicks in, once you kind of become the new awakened person, as it were, then this, th that's where the similarities seem to start and just kind of the, the awakening and the, the enlightenment, as it were, that comes from 
that transformation. And it's it's like James said, you better be ready to go to work, boy. Like, put your boots on. Let's go, because it's you know it it takes work, and that's action, man. You you put it out there in that other side. Like I look at like uh, you know physics, um, action reaction. The force to, to propel has to be applied in the opposite direction. Well, if you go to that darkness, you go to that spot, and you put that force there, it'll propel you. You know. Oh, that's a good way to put it, Steve. So we could use the darkness for our benefit. You're darn right. The help. Like the to help. Yeah, yeah that's, that's everything really... in my past. Everything in my past, all the darkness, I'm grateful for because it it taught me so much. And you mm. need like a lot of times you need the dark. Uh, people call it the dark night of the soul, where you go to the depths of hell and you witness and you experience what other people in hell experience and you come out from that it allows you to help them people those people that are stuck because you've been there and absolutely and it's having that space where people to get it and you're you know you can you're in this safe spot where you can let those thoughts come and you can process whatever it is you have to process and learn from that you know, like whether it be uh, while well, you're drinking, you know, with your with, sitting with that camera happy spirit and you have these visuals, you know, sometimes they say the visions are a distraction, but sometimes the visions can be very helpful, especially if you're a very visual learner and you can sit there and you can talk with that stuff and work through things. Or like I did in the sweat lodge, you know, you have time, the space, the process with all these beautiful people and singing these beautiful songs. And it's just, you know, it's, it's what these things are there for. They've been around for a long time. <laughs> So, and it, like it's so clear that this didn't happen to you guys out of the blue like as you said Steve like you guys worked your butts off and I think that's a key message that needs to be shared with this psychedelic renaissance as it were is they really aren't just magic pills and then all of a sudden your life is completely changed. Like you can take what these substances give you and run with it or not, you know, and it's, and you might, you might have a beautiful, colorful experience and your might, your life might stay exactly the same, or you can take it and use it to integrate kind of a more spiritual way of being a more wholesome way of being. And then your life can be entirely different in a year or two, if, if it even takes that long. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the change, well, for me, it was instantaneous. Like it happened right away. And, and it's kind of like the after effect is what you get to see. So you only get to see, you don't get to see the water droplet, you get to see the ripples. And the ripples are, are kind of what we're looking at here with James and Steve is these beautiful ripple effects of how wonderful and big your hearts can grow. That's mm. what I see is this deep connection that way. Mm. And speaking about water, I don't think I've ever cried so much in my life. <laughs> like through that fasting period? It, through all of it. You know, yeah. like you, some of that culture, you know, men are told never to cry. Don't cry, right? Bullshit. Mm -hmm. Cry. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make you any less of a man. No, I think everyone needs that flow. And um, it's, it's social nature between, I don't know, you guys would know better than me because you're men. Because I just can cry and then I can just go and make a sandwich and everything's fine. Like it's, a, it's like a normal, normal thing for, for being a woman. But then sometimes it's not. Like I, I'm just saying for me personally, um, it's totally okay. Although it's painful for some to see you cry, mm -hmm. but it just means they got to do work. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Everything's okay. Everything's okay for sure. So if uh, anybody who's on the Zoom has a question, you can throw it in the chat box there and we'll get that question answered for either of these guys or Jazz. Oh, there it is. And it looks like, uh, you know, Everybody really appreciates what you guys are doing and sharing. There's some comments about just how human this conversation is. Thank you for that. And 
I like that. Crying is good shedding. Thank you for sharing the experiences. Yeah, I see one question for, for me. And how did I learn my roster of Icaros? Dieta. You have to do a dieta. I spend lots of time with the plants. Um, and I also uh, practice my teacher songs and many of the uh, maestros and maestro songs that are from Mayantuyaku in Peru. I practice them. And then eventually, once I started drinking all those plants, the plants started talking to me, like not in English or anything, but they started giving me vibrations. And now I just, um, and now I just use those vibrations and the the specific, I get they're they're more like incantations. Um, I mostly learned from a really powerful teacher is Kami Renako, Kami Renako and um, Tamamori. Shiwawaku, Tawadi, um, Kamalanga, things like that. They're they're um, they're really great plants that way. And also, it- I'll put my I'll put my email in the chat if you guys have any questions you want to talk about um, a little bit later too. Just yeah, there's a, another wanna- question for you. What plants did you learn from? Any you want to mention in particular? Oh yeah, I said that. I said Kamaranako, Tamamori, Shiwako, Tawari, um, Bobin Sana, Bobin Sana. You gotta, you gotta do that. Bobin Sana. <laughs> you can get the paste. You can get it at Massive Herbs, or you can, you can just get it on Etsy even. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's that's probably the best thing. Bobin Sana, heart opener heart opener because your heart's your teacher we just don't realize it we don't realize it's not just it's not just about our brain like our brain is to function my my central nervous system um i feel like my heart is what communicates and that's what's communicating with us okay i'm gonna put the plant names in the (laughs) in the chat here so thank you to marky for those comments a question from uh ala i think I don't think it shows the full name, but it says, how does one learn to become an ethical and knowledgeable practitioner of these healing arts? I'm afraid there might be a lot of programs springing up with the psychedelic renaissance and bad actors showing up. So that's a question that's really on the front and center of our minds at the Canadian Psychedelic Association. One of the kind of primary motivations for us starting this organization was to kind of set a a, a high bar in that regard and we actually have a uh, another webinar coming up next Wednesday the 24th of March which uh, Jasmine will be at and a bunch of the board members Rick Doblin from MAPS will be there as well and that is around ethical business practices so we're going to dive into kind of the business side of things but you know big big question how do you you know there's there's bad actors in in every profession, I'm afraid, and the the best we can do is be the example, and we're we're doing our best to to be that. A uh, question from Facebook: Do you think you could have achieved similar? Okay, do, do you think you guys could have achieved similar kind of transformations with something like psilocybin? psychedelic psychotherapy versus ayahuasca or ibogaine ibogaine was it no absolutely not nothing is like ayahuasca for me (laughs) anyways and i've done lots of hallucinogens and ayahuasca is the it was the thing for me man it blew my mind open and i went someone was asking about where would you recommend i went to sacred valley in peru arcana center and it was it was amazing like just that area, they call it Sacred Valley for a reason. It's uh, it's a connected area. It was close. Like I said, it was like going to heaven. You go there, it's like going to heaven, and the people that work there are angels. And yeah, it's amazing. Nice. Um, you know, I'll I'll in defense of psilocybin, I've seen some pretty awesome transformations with psilocybin as well. And it really it depends on the person. It depends on the time, the place, the set, the setting, the what you're ready for that. And probably most importantly, how much you're ready to change. Um, uh, Jazz, for you, how do you feel about academic institutions and new corporations researching and adopting psychedelics as part of mental health therapies? I think it's absolutely necessary. And I think it's absolutely necessary. I think 
this is kind of a reflection of my feeling of it having, we need it. We absolutely need it. And we need to educate academic institutions to, to about these, these experiences these men have had and how they've lived their lives. Because really when you're, when you're in academia and I've been in academia and it's like the ivory tower, like you, you really only read it to see it at the front line, I think is what's going to cause the effect. Because when the researcher connects with, say, their, their um, not participant, but, but a participant, they're actually connecting. Their hearts are both connecting and, and they're interviewing them and they're like asking questions and, and you're really creating this connection. So in academia, that would be really valuable. I know that there's downsides to it because there, there is a lot of downsides to academia where, where people wouldn't. They might not fully understand, but if all the academics are doing it and all of them are, are partaking in this research, I think that that even though I can't do everything, there's someone else that's going to think of another thing that I wouldn't have thought of. The more people we have working toward this, the better. Um, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. And especially people like my teacher, Juan Flores in Maya Antuyaku, like he wanted to help the Indigenous people in Canada, and he has helped us deeply, deeply. And he, you know, the medicine for us to take that medicine, that's a, that's a gift. That's a powerful gift because I don't know how many people on, on the planet have had ayahuasca, but it's got to be just tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands, but it's just not everybody gets that opportunity. So these men and like to have the opportunity to do ayahuasca, that's a, that's a powerful gift. And it, especially for Indigenous people here in Canada, because we've been traumatized for 120, 150 years. And this is how we, we this is how many uh, of my, my friends and my colleagues have helped themselves to recover in a really big way. I wish I could have, uh, could have brought some of my um, Indigenous friends too. Um, but in the future, this is why this is a, a series, right? Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think there's valid concern over kind of indigenous healing modalities being utilized um, in mass. And then, you know, what happens when corporations and academia starts working with these substances? And I, those are all very valid questions. But I think we need to move each aspect of this movement needs to move forward. And I feel as though these medicines, if anything, could be the hub that link all of those things up in a very harmonious way if we do it correctly. I, I've seen, um, you know, I've seen people comment almost in a way where they would like to invent an anti-capitalist utopia and get that in place before we give anybody the medicines. And I think it's kind of the opposite of that, I think, is our path forward. It's it's let's get medicines in people in a very good way, help them to experience the kind of transformation that Steve and James have had. And the world, we get, an, we get that tipping point happen of enough people having those kind of awakening type experiences that these guys had, and we won't live in the same kind of world. That's the kind of world I want to live in. So I think we are. Oh, oh, wait, there's just one, go for one it. more yeah. I want to. One more I want to go to, um, it, it's the, the, when you go to ayahuasca, this person was shamed for your use of cannabis because it's sticky. Okay, I, I come across this quite often, quite often. Cannabis is sticky. Many times we're taught in the ayahuasca world that ayahuasca is a jealous plant. But if you have work to do with cannabis, like if you have if you have some sort of something inside yourself that's not happy about yourself using cannabis, then ayahuasca is not going to agree with you or the ayahuasca is not going to agree with your use of it. However, I smoke cannabis or I haven't been smoking it lately, but I use cannabis and my ayahuasca and I have definitely been <laughs> ashamed for that. But I ask ayahuasca, I ask the camaranthi, I'm like, hey, is this okay? And they're like, yeah, you'll know when to stop. Yeah, you'll know when. Yeah, and it, a lot of people say that. I, I definitely, I, I know where that's coming from um, with the ayahuasca practices. Uh, but I think it's okay. I think it's okay. My, 
my teacher knows about it. He says ayahuasca is, uh, cannabis is as powerful as ayahuasca. And so if you've ever eaten a cookie before, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. and, but I don't, I don't think it's exactly comparable. I'll disagree with him on that, but um, you can have some very powerful psychedelic experiences eating cannabis. So yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> cannabis has been a big part of my spiritual path for sure. It's, it's not in my life the way it used to be, but I got to give a lot of credit to that plant for sure. Um, guys, do you have anything you want to kind of share with the world before we wrap up? And then jazz, I'm going to, I'm going to ask very kindly if you might wrap things up with a Nicaro once, oh. once these guys say a final couple words, Steve. Yeah. Final couple words. Um, listen to your heart. It'll never do you wrong. Uh, I feel that life speaks to all of us in a different way. And it'll show, it'll show you. And so follow that, go there. It's trying to teach you something. You know, if you ask that question, it'll give you that answer, you know? So follow your heart. It takes courage, but you can do it. You can do it. Um, I want to thank the CPA for having me on. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Jazz. Uh, thank you, Alan, you know, right on brother. Uh, if he's listening, I don't know if he is. I have to give a big shout out to my man, you know, Brave Eagle. He's helped me out through so much uh, along this journey as, as well. Um, so, and all the people, you know, at the Lodge, all the people I've sat with and sang with and all that good stuff. So again, thank you. Follow your heart. Keep it going. Keep journeying. Thanks, Steve. Yes, um, I agree with that. Follow your heart is a big one, man. And, um, Go inwards, go within. That's where the work work needs to be done, is within, not without. And I'd like to thank the Canadian Psychedelic Association too for this work, because it's so important. Like right here is so important. We need to merge the medicine. We need ayahuasca, we need these medicines. Like Jasmine said, from the trauma of residential schools, like that's a big thing in Canada. And that ayahuasca would help so much. So yeah, so I just thank I'm thankful for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank both of you guys and thanks Jazz. Um, some more kind of housekeeping and announcements. This is the first of uh, many we hope for this rocket ship from Rock Bottom web series. If you want to email us, you can e <gasps> email us at rocketship at psychedelicassociation.net. And that will go to Jazz and I actually. And if you have a, a transformational story using these medicines or other methods, I think that's another important thing that we covered here is it, it wasn't just psychedelic plant medicines or psychedelics in general that cause these transformations. It was things like fasting. It was things like meditation. We want to hear all those stories. And if, if psychedelics happen to be a component, great. But um, send us those emails. If we don't get back to you, don't worry. We are going to read them all. And when the time comes, there's a chance we'll have you on one of these shows, Rocket Ship from Rock Bottom. So Rocket Ship at psychedelicassociation.net. Um, the CPA really has a mission and mandate to unite Canada's psychedelic community. If you would like to be a part of that, please do. Please become a member with us. Uh, please join in on these webinars. If you, there's donations that are, um, you know, requested as you join these webinars. If you become a member of the CPA, you just automatically get included in them. So there's lots of benefits, lots of value that we're adding to becoming a member of the CPA. Uh, Catalyst Conference is coming up, catalystpresents.ca, or just go to the psychedelicassociation.net website and you can get a 10% off discount code there. Jasmine is going to do a uh, presentation there that's all about the Icaros that she sings. So it's going to be, uh, I don't think she's ever done a presentation like that before. It'll be one no. of a kind. No. no so, I... yeah. so you're going to see in a second, she is a singer. So it's going to be a, a great thing to have her sing at Catalyst. And um, just from the bottom of my heart, Steve and James, thank you so much for sharing your stories. And more than sharing your stories, thanks for being your stories. Thanks for becoming the transformation that you felt in your, in somewhere in the depths of your being needed to happen. Um, 
and I, I hope it I hope it gives hope. I, I, I think there is great hope around these substances and their ability to transform lives. And there's a lot of people in really desperate and dark places right now. And I think you guys sharing your story like you did today just might offer that little ray of hope that somebody so desperately needs. So we will wrap this up in just a few minutes. But first of all, my dear, dear sister, thank you so much for inspiring this web series. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being on the board of directors of the CPA. Thank you for carrying the medicine the way that you do. Thank you for carrying yourself in the, your day job the way you do. We didn't even get into that, but you help so many people in so many different ways in your life. And it's a real honor to know you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Trevor. And thank you for all of your Ed McMahons. <laughs> Everything, just the, the support. Uh, it's really awesome. And it's really great that we all have a platform that we can we can share this with. But the main thing I want to share with you is the Icaros, because that's really what moved me. You know, it's not just the the medicine itself, but the medicine all taught me everything. So this Icaro is about, um, about the plants that I've drank, maybe not all of them, because that's a pretty long song. Um, but but many, <laughs> many of the plants and, and many of them that are very dear to me. And this is my teacher's song, Maestro Juan Flores. Mapachito muera shamu como paisito kayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
Camira na como era, chamo como paisito, cai, ai, 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 ai. Se está em bom dia, Maridi, se está em bom dia, Maridi, se está em bom dia, Maridi. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Steve and James and Trevor. And um, hopefully I'll get to share some more songs at the conference and uh, share some more magic medicine because that's my medicine. Um, and I'm just so thankful that we could share these stories. And I would love to hear, I would love to hear everybody else's stories and um, see how, how far we can go. I think the language, I think that's Quechua or Ashninga, <laughs> in case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah, that, that took a, a few years to learn that. <laughs> worth it. So but worth thank it. You, thank you so much. It's just, wow, wow. Those are, those are some of the plants that I drank. That, and they'll, hopefully their energy will help everyone here learn and heal and recover and open your heart and um, connect with the sacred powers of the plants. That's everything that I sang about. So wonderful. Beautiful. Thank you, sister. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, brothers. Thanks to everybody who tuned in live. Thanks to everybody who watches this in the, uh, in the future. Please share it. Please uh, hang out with us at the Canadian Psychedelic Association. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.